Hello and welcome to Fluid Mechanics. My name is Dr. Mark Taylor, lecturer in civil engineering. So this is unit eight, hydraulic structures. So this is unit eight of 10. And in this unit, we're going to look at hydraulic structures, in particular weirs, flumes, sluice gates, and culverts. So during this session, I aim to explain the common hydraulic structures found in open channels, identify the common types of weir and relevant theory, identify why we need control and where, and consider the common control gates used. I'll also introduce the concepts of a culvert. By the end of this unit, you should be able to explain the common uses for control structures in open channels, describe the common weir types, identify the use of weirs in open channels, explain how hydraulic structures can be used to measure discharge, explain the difference between free flowing and submerged conditions, and understand the theory used to calculate flow discharge in weirs. Hydraulic structures and channels have three main functions. These include measuring and controlling discharge, controlling water levels, and dissipating unwanted energy. Measurement and control of discharge is the most common application. For example, irrigation networks require structures at each canal junction to measure and control discharge so that there's an equitable distribution of water. Natural rivers also require flow measurement so that engineers can ensure there's adequate supply and base flows for environmental purposes, for example, to protect fish stocks. Measurements for flood flows are also important as they allow precautions to be taken to avoid or control flooding in urban areas. Here you can see some examples of hydraulic structures in open channels, where they've been used to control discharge, or control the water level, or regulate flow. So here you can see aerial photographs of the Ooster Scheldt Kering, the Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier, and this is between the islands of Schuven Develand and Nord Beveland the largest of the 13 Delta Work series of dams and storm surge barriers designed to protect the Netherlands from flooding from the North Sea. The construction of the Delta Works was a response to the widespread damage of loss of life in the North Sea flood of 1953. So the Netherlands is in a unique situation where the majority of the land is below sea level and they have a reference datum called the Normaal Amsterdam Pile or the NAP. The infrastructure of Amsterdam all depends on a stone at the centre of Dam Square, and this stone caps a bolt that marks Amsterdam's zero level, or sea level, and it's based on high tide in the summer of the nearby Zelda Sea Bay. The reference point, called the Amsterdam Ordnance Datum, which translates to the normal Amsterdam Pile, or NEP, is the heart of the European network of national levelling networks. So in other words, the NEP is the prime meridian of elevation. The bottom image on the left here shows the NEP level in Almira town centre and you can see the black brick marks the level of the NEP and you can see that the ground here is substantially below sea level. The image on the right shows another marker at the side of a canal which shows the NEP levels. So the image on the left here shows the NEP datum in the Amsterdam town hall and on the right hand side we can see a weir plate with an NEP marker at the side of it. So this NEP datum is used to control the level of water in irrigation channels and agricultural land in the Netherlands. So I'm now going to explain what we mean by free and submerged or drowned flow. So the sluice gate example shown here, if you look at the top image, image A, this shows the flow freely passing under the gate with hydraulic jump downstream. The downstream depth has no effect on the upstream depth and this is referred to as free flow and there's a formula for calculating discharge based on this condition. So if you look at figure B, what we can see here is the jump has moved upstream and drowned out the gate, and this is referred to as drowned flow or submerged flow. So again, if we consider the sluice gate example, we can see in figure A that the downstream depth D2 has no effect on the upstream depth D1, and this is referred to as free flow. And I'm gonna show you the specific formula for calculating flow in this condition. In some circumstances, the jump moves upstream and drowns out the gate, and this is referred to as drowned or submerged flow. The downstream flow may appear turbulent and have the appearance of a hydraulic jump, but inside the flow action is very different. There's very little turbulent mixing and the supercritical flow is passing underneath the subcritical flow. The jet is not stopped quickly as a hydraulic jump, but is slowed down gradually over a greater distance through the forces of friction on the channel bed. This flow condition can cause damage to the bed of the channel. Under these conditions, the formula for discharge must be modified 
to include the influence of the downstream water level on the upstream level. So I'm now going to introduce the concept of a weir and we're going to explain some of the different types of weir that can be used in open channels. So the control of water levels and the regulation of discharge are necessary for the purposes of irrigation, water conservation, flood alleviation and inland navigation and I've shown you some previous examples in the Netherlands. Weirs are elevated structures in open channels that are used to control outflow and or measure flow from basins and drainage channels. Certain installation requirements must be complied with if they are to accurately fulfil their role as a measuring device. The upstream face of the crest plate must be vertical and the crest plate must be manufactured from brass or stainless steel. Sharp crested weirs, long base weirs and throated flumes are a unique category as their sole function is discharge measurement. And if you look at BSISO 8368 2019, you can look at some examples of the application of hydrometric determinations, flow measurements and open channels using such structures. So now we're going to look at the family of sharp crested weirs. So there's a family of weirs known as sharp crested weirs, and they're used to measure relatively small discharges. They comprise of a thin sheet with a sharp edge, hence the term. And by measuring the depth of water above the weir, the discharge can be calculated. There is a unique relationship between the head and the weir and the discharge, so one simple measurement determines the discharge. So sharp crested weirs are often slender and lack stability, therefore they're not applicable to use in debris-laden flood discharges. Under continuous operating conditions, the crest can become rounded and this will adversely affect calibration. The field application is generally limited to laboratories and small artificial channels and streams. The rectangular weir and the triangular V-notch weir are the most common examples and the most efficient sharp crested structures. Other forms include the trapezoidal and compound weirs. Sharp crested or thin plate weirs consist of a thin metal plate inserted vertically across the width of the channel. To be considered sharp, the ratio of the height of the water above the crest of the weir to the thickness of the weir must be greater than 1.5. Under this condition, flow separates from the upstream edge of the weir, and this is a characteristic of sharp crested weirs. In flow measurement applications, the thickness of the steel plate will be between 1 and 2 millimetres. So I'm now going to show you some specific examples of sharp crested weirs. I'm going to start with the rectangular weir. So rectangular weirs have a rectangular cross section. And they can either be suppressed or uncontracted, that is the opening spans the entire width of the channel, or they can be unsuppressed or contracted and only spans a portion of the width of the channel. Suppressed rectangular weirs are often called basin weirs. So the weir has a rectangular opening and water flows through this and plunges downstream. And the overflowing water is called a nape. And the discharge can be calculated using the Polanyi equation, where C subscript D is the coefficient of discharge, B is the width of the weir, H is the head of the weir measurement above the crest, and the coefficient of discharge allows for all the discrepancies between the theoretical experiments and the use of a rectangular weir in practice. So there are a number of theoretical discrepancies in the Polanyi equation, and they include the following. The pressure distribution in the water over the crest of the weir is not uniformly atmospheric. The water surface does not remain horizontal as the water approaches the weir. And viscous effects that cause a non-uniform velocity and a loss of energy between sections 1 and 2 have been neglected and the approach velocity head might not be negligible. So the error in the flow rate resulting from these theoretical discrepancies is accounted for by a discharge coefficient C subscript D. And it's convenient to express the discharge formula as shown here, where C subscript W is the weir coefficient and is related to the discharge coefficient as shown. Sharp crested weir is a control structure since the flow rate of the weir is determined by the stage just upstream of the weir. And this relationship assumes that the water downstream of the weir, called the tail water, does not interfere with the operation of the weir. If the tail water rises above the crest of the weir, then the flow becomes influenced by the downstream flow conditions and the weir is said to be submerged. The discharge over the submerged weir can be estimated in terms of the upstream and downstream heads in the weir using the Villamonte formula. The value of H must be measured at least 2.5 times H upstream of the weir and YD measured beyond the turbulence of the nape. When used for flow measurement, they should be designed to discharge freely rather than submerged because of the greater accuracy. So I'm now going to show you what's known as a Cipolletti weir. 
So a sepaletti weir is a contracted weir that is related to the rectangular sharp crested weirs. They have a trapezoidal cross section with side slopes of 1 and 4. The advantage of this weir is that corrections for end contractions are not necessary and the discharge over a sepaletti weir is greater than that over a rectangular weir with the same crest width. The discharge formula for a sepaletti weir is shown below. So now we're going to look at what are called V-notch weirs. So a V-notch weir is a sharp crested weir that has a V-shaped opening. It's often called a triangular weir and they're used instead of rectangular weirs when lower discharges are required for a given head or where lower flow rates are to be measured with greater accuracy. They are usually limited to flow rates of about 0.28 cubic metres per second or less. They are frequently found in small irrigation channels and they're very common in the Netherlands in agricultural irrigation channels. And the flow over a V-notch weir can be given by the equation shown below. The vertex angles are usually between 10 and 120 degrees, the most common being 120, 90, 60 and 45 degrees. So you can see the equation used to calculate the quantity of flow across a V-notch weir, where the angle theta is the vertex angle of the weir. So now we're going to look at what we call compound weirs. So a compound weir is a combination of different types of weir in a single structure. The most common compound weir consists of a rectangular weir with a V-notch in the middle. These are commonly used in stormwater management systems, where the V-notch is used to regulate the release of initial volume of runoff stored in a detention area. The rectangular component of the weir provides controlled release of a larger volume of runoff. The V-notch is referred to as the bleeder, and combining the two weir types yields the discharge equation shown. So you can see a compound weir shown the suppressed rectangular weir at the top and the V-notch bleeder weir in the middle, and also the equation for calculating the flow. If you want to read more on this subject, look at Chin's book, page 309, section 7413. So we're now going to look at solid weirs, and the first one we're going to look at is a broad crested weir. Uh, what I'm going to do now is show you a short video of the fluids lab and show you one in the Gunt flume. So the broad crested weirs, also known as long based weirs, have significantly broader crests than sharp crested weirs. They are typically constructed in concrete and have rounded edges and are capable of handling much larger discharges than sharp crested weirs. There are several different designs of broad crested weir and the rectangular broad crested weir is the most common. So a typical broad crested weir is shown below. They operate on the theory that the elevation of the weir above the channel base is sufficient to create critical flow conditions over the weir. The flow rate must also be corrected to account for energy losses, and we do this by using a discharge coefficient, C subscript D. The quantity of flow in C subscript D can be calculated as shown below. So the table shown here summarises the weir classifications and the different flow conditions that happen in each weir. So in certain flow conditions, we're going to need control gates. So we're now going to look at controlled or gated spillways. So vertical spillway gates may consist of either vertical gates or sluice gates or radial or tainter gates. So we'll start off by introducing the tainter or radial control gate. So a tainter control gate consists of an arc shaped face supported by radial struts. The radial struts are attached to a central horizontal shaft called a trunnion, which transfers the hydrostatic forces to the supporting concrete structure. Since the vector of the resultant hydrostatic forces passes through the axis of the horizontal shaft, only the weight of the gate needs to be lifted to open the gate. So radial gates are economical to install and are widely used in both underflow and overflow applications. So gated spillways are used to control discharges from reservoirs and also control flows in rivers and canals. The flow at a gated spillway is controlled when the gate opening influences the discharge. 
It is uncontrolled when the gate does not influence the discharge and is lifted out of the water. Both vertical and tainter gates are used on spillways. Vertical gates are more common when the discharge is submerged. The gates can be seated on the spillway crest or downstream of the crest as shown opposite. So we're now going to have a look at the subject of flumes. So flumes are critical flow structures that can be used to measure discharge. They are sometimes called throated flumes because critical conditions are achieved by narrowing the width of the channel. Downstream of the throat there's normally a short length of supercritical flow followed by a hydraulic jump. The flow then returns to subcritical flow. And the formula for discharging can be determined in the same way as for solid weirs. The head loss through the flume is much lower than for weirs, so they are suited for situations where we want to keep head losses as low as possible. So finally we're going to look at the subject of culverts. Culvert design is probably a module in its own right, but we're going to just introduce the subject and explain some of the concepts that are considered. So you can see some examples of sectional precast concrete culverts. Culverts are used to transfer rivers or burns underneath roads or railways. So culverts are short conduits that are designed to pass peak flood discharges under roads, railways or embankments. And due to the function they perform, they're often referred to as cross drainage structures. They perform a similar function to that of bridges, but with small spans, typically less than six metres. They're also designed to have a submerged inlet. Typical cross sections include circular, arched, rectangular and oval shapes. They can be either single barrel or multiple barrel. Rectangular culverts are often referred to as box culverts. They have a simple appearance but are complex to design as the hydraulic performance is very complex. So let's leave this design until year three. Six different flow conditions are recognised and these depend upon the size, shape, length and the position in relation to the upstream and downstream water level. Hydraulic structures and channels have three main functions. They can either measure or control discharge, or control water levels, or dissipate unwanted energy. Natural rivers also require flow measurement so that engineers can ensure there's adequate supply of base flows for environmental purposes. And the control of water levels and the regulation of discharge are necessary for purposes of irrigation. And I've shown you some examples of that in Holland. Gated spillways are used to control discharges from reservoirs and also control flows in rivers and canals. We can also use flumes as critical flow structures that can be used to measure discharge. And finally, introduce the subject of a culvert, which is a short conduit that can be designed to pass peak flood discharges under a road, railway or embankment. So if you get a chance, get out and try and find a culvert, a weir or control gate local to you. Try to find out some information about it, take some photographs if safe and share your findings with the class. There's a great culvert near Edinburgh Park which carries a gogo burn underneath the city bypass. Maybe you could go out there on the tram or the bus and have a look. If you can't get out, you could also have a look on Google Street View. It's a good idea to go on a wet day because you'll see the culvert in full flow and you'll also see the bar screen in action which will catch the logs and other debris that washes down the burn and protects a small pumping station. You can see the location of the culvert at Edinburgh Park. It's probably about a 15-20 minute walk from Edinburgh Park Station or Tram Hall, but you can actually walk through the culvert and underneath the bypass and get to the other side. You can also get a very clear view of the bar screen and the small pumping station. So once we've finished the tutorial questions for Unit 8, we're then going to move on to the subject of waves, where we're going to look at wave types, waves at sea, flooding and tidal power. So thanks for listening. Bye for now.